Um, our next speaker, Mehdi Amini, um, started this project in his free time, which often I, I think represents another class of project. So when he's speaking about Python today, um, his PhD D is an optimizing compiler, so a free time project in optimizing Python is a little more impactful than perhaps some of uh, my free time projects. So um, from this talk, I think you'll learn a little bit more about how we can squeeze a e even more performance out of our Pythonic code, and uh, I'm excited to learn about what he's going to share. Thanks. I don't need the mic. It's fine. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm here to talk about PyTran. So PyTran is our pet project that we are doing on our free time. Um, so it was started two years ago by Serge Galton, a friend of mine, we did our PhD in the same lab. Uh, so I joined him to, to work on this project and we were sponsored by the company I'm working on, I'm working for, Silcan, for the first year. And uh, Pierrick Brunet is the third developer, very active. He's also doing this on his free time. So yeah, we are just doing this for fun, and we enjoy it. So yeah, it's Sunday morning. I know it will be hard for everyone. I'm not as good as James Powell. Uh, I really enjoyed this talk yesterday, so I will try to do my best to keep you wake up. Right. So uh, quick disclaimer, just uh, all the software and the hardware I use to show you the number um, I will give. Uh, you have to take into account that I did some benchmark on my personal laptop, so it's really not like, it's just a rough idea of the numbers you can get, uh, especially the comparison. It's not intended to be fair against the competition, of course. I'm not a Pythonista originally, but I'm interested in performance. Uh, my daily job doesn't use at all Python. I'm doing driver level C code, assembly code, multi-threaded C++ framework and GPU programming. So, yeah, I don't have as many jokes as uh, Chris uh, Lafna yesterday, but um, what I'm good at is um, flame war. So <laughs> maybe we can try. So my claim is that we C++ programmer are more social than you guys. <laughs> and I have some support for my claim, just that we compile code. So you don't have any, you don't have any <laughs> excuse to go fun like us. And even this talk is compiled because I wrote it in LaTeX. So it gives me 10 seconds of free time every time I recompile it. So but I heard that not everyone is as passionate as in C++ and low level code as I am. I don't understand why, but it seems that people tend to prefer high level programming framework to prototype their tools. And it seems that many of them tend to use Python. So it seems that what Python has is a huge ecosystem, a lot of tools, a lot of libraries that helps you build programs very fast. Um, I don't know much about Python, but it doesn't really matter because all I care is this little white spot if this big black uh, circle is your program, then this little white dot is the part that annoy you because it's what take time, what eats up your CPU, and this is what you want to optimize, and this is what I care about, so I don't need to understand the rest of your applications. So let's show quickly what we offer with Python with a regular IPython session. I, um, so this is the Rosenbrock function, just as an example, um, applied on a, an Empire array. And you can see that it takes a few milliseconds, 35 milliseconds. And to use Python, it's not that hard. The only thing you have to do is load an extension, of course, a bit of magic, and then add this one single um, green annotation with a type, which is just a Python command, it's gonna be ignored by Python, but Python will use it. And then you can just run your benchmark again and it gets just a little bit faster, means like 290. So yeah, and that's pretty easy to use. So how it works, I will go into a little bit more details later. So we take a Python module, we take 
eventually some OpenMP annotation. And Python, we process this Python module using the Python IST module. So Python is fully written in Python. And it generates a C++ meta program. Um, I will explain a bit later what I mean. And then we fit this program to the compiler, the host compiler, G++ or Clang. And with a bunch of library, Boost Python, of course, but also Python E++, which is our own runtime library, and some other libraries like NT2, I will talk about it later. We generate a native module that can be imported and used as any Python module. So our goals, so performance first. So we sacrifice some language feature. We only handle a subset of Python. And the thing that we don't handle are just useless stuff. Nobody use it, I guess. Less class, evil, uh, introspection, polymorphic variable, right? Um, yeah. Backward compatibility matters. So we don't change Python. It's pure Python. It stays compatible when you write code for Python. With Python in mind, it stays compatible with Python. And this is important because it means your code won't be specialized for Python. You can still use it normally. And there is no exit cost or entry cost for Python. The entry cost is low. The exit cost is, is known. So it's not a tool where you are stick to it. Um, and we offer modular compilation, which means you can compile, you, you compile one module, and it will interact with the rest of your code. We focus on numerical kernels. So I showed you the hotspot earlier. And to do that, we do a lot of static analysis. We do vectorization, parallelization when we can. And yeah, the reason we do static compilation is that it buys time for complex analysis. So why do we use C++? So modern C++, since C++ 11s, has a lot of cool stuff. I'm sure you are all familiar with duck typing in, Pyt in uh, Python, right? If it makes the noise of a duck and it flies like a duck, it's probably a duck. Um, it turns out that in C++, you can have the same thing using templates. And I show you an example here where on top you have just a simple sum, um, Python, regular Python sum. Uh, it's a dot product. And the same in C++, which uh, I'm sure you will agree is a lot more beautiful. Um, using templates takes two parameters, L0, L1, and then computes a sum using our own template library. And it does exactly the same thing. And both codes doesn't assume, they don't assume anything on the arguments. It just have to be iterable. It can be generator, it can be a list, it can be an array, it can be whatever as soon as you can, as long as you can iterate over it, it will accept it. You can even pass one list and one array, it will work. So the thing we don't support is heterogeneous container, which means if you give us a list, it has to contain either floats, either integer, either whatever, but you cannot have a list which contains uh, integer, floats, string, and so on. So it has to be uniform, just like NumPy array. Uh, internally, we unbox the list in arrays before processing them. Um, so that's how it works. So C++ as a backend, it's convenient because it's a high-level language, which means we can do a lot of, of stuff. We have the rich template library provided by the standard. We have object-oriented programming. We have metaprogramming. I showed you a bit of template, and we have also Type inference now in C++11, you can use these auto keywords and it will automatically detect the type everywhere. You don't have to think about it. And it's easier for our code generation. We have Viadic template, which is mind blowing usually, but very convenient. And C++ is also a low level backend in some way. There are few hidden costs. You don't pay for what you don't use is really the motto of C++. You have access to vector unit. You can write intrinsic directly. And when I say vector unit, I'm a vector instruction, I'm really talking about what your CPU has. In one cycle, it can compute a multiplication on four floats on modern machine. So you can really do that in, uh, in C++. Good luck in Python. Um, it's good for parallel programming also. Lots of library, lots of tools. And even in the standard, maybe in a few years, the parallel STL has just been proposed. So let's dive into 
the back end. No, I'm joking. Just wanted to see your face. It looks exactly like this, promise. Um, I will only do Python, no more C++. So static compilation. We do static compilation because it saves time. Uh, well, not save time. We have a lot of time. When we do static compilation, and by static compilation I mean not JIT, it's ahead of time, we can take 10 seconds to compile. It doesn't really matter if it's online, then, well, 10 seconds is a bit long. But then we can do a lot of powerful optimization analysis. So you only annotate uh, the type in Python for the exported function, which means the, inter the public <laughs> interface of your module, the function that has to be imported. You don't have to add any, if you have a long module and you annotate three functions, you will be able to import the three function in other modules, and all the other one will be kind of private. They won't be exported. So I will talk about some analysis. So the analysis is the part of Python where we gather a lot of information. And Python is really modular, which means all analysis, they operate on, uh, as visitor on the AST, and they can be extracted from Python very easily. Everything is combined with a path manager at some point, just like LLVM does, if you know it. Um, so yeah, some uh, analysis. Um, for instance, points two. Points two in a, is an analysis where you try to know when you have an identifier, here C, where it can point to in memory, what parts of the memory it can uh, refer. And here, it can point to the memory of A, the memory of B, or maybe a new memory if A and B are just scalar, for instance. And this is really an important optimization uh, analysis because it will allow us to build other powerful analysis on top of it. So it's also something very well known from C, C compilers because of pointers, and they try to do it very hard. It's, it's not an easy, an easy analysis in general, but on most examples, we, kind of, we are able to find out. Some other analysis that we do is trying to find if a function is pure, um, not pure. Here it's just first if a function will modify, will have a side effect on the arguments. So here the first function, Fibonacci, obviously doesn't modify n. So it's it side effect free on the arguments. And then bar, apply a map on Fibonacci. Um, and since the compiler knows that Fib is side effect free on the arguments, it will infer that bar is also, which means that Python builds a call graph and is able to do this interprocedural analysis, propagating through the call graph all these informations. And it will deduce that bar is side effect free on L. And uh, yeah, we will propagate this through the wall call graph in, in Python. And from that, we will build another analysis, which is pure function. So what we call pure function is purely side effect free, which means side effect free on its arguments, but also on the global state of the program. For instance, here, F0 is pure in what we call pure, but F1 is not, because even though it calls a pure function, which is fine, it's also called print, and print as an IO, which is considered as a, go a global state. Why it matters? Because when we do some map, then some map can be turned into parallel map or not, depending on the purity of the function. So Python is able to detect that and parallelize then some map depending on the function. We have used DevChains. It's a classic compiler analysis. It's dependency analysis. It tries to find in the flow, the control flow, where a definition of a variable which means the results of a computation will be used. So we can sometimes eliminate code that is useless or reorganize code, changing the order of the statements and preserving um, the, the semantic of your program. So what do we do with all these analyses? And we have some others, but I won't have time to go into detail. We turn them into code optimization. So first example, code optimization is detection of false polymorphism. So we have trouble with polymorphism. Polymorphism is a variable that you will use as a string and later as an integer. And yeah, so it costs a lot of dynamic checking, so you want to avoid it. 
So we try to statically type as much as possible. And for instance, in this code, uh, thanks to use of chains, we can see that the first definition of A will never reach uh, the use of foo. So we can rename it using A0, for instance. And only the two other definitions of A will reach foo. And foo will be then perfectly typed with a non-able string. So Python is able to detect that automatically. And any type in Python can be decayed to known. So this is completely statically typed. Another optimization is turned iterator into lazy iterator. For instance, here, we try to convert map into IMAP uh, to save temporary allocation and be able to build, uh, to reduce some expressions. So the first one um, can be easily turned into IMAP. And maybe you've got hints by the function name. The second one cannot be turned into an IMAP. This is because we modify L later, and we use it two times in the return. So if you were using an IMAP there, the result would just be not the same. So we don't do it here. So Python is able to detect these cases and do it where, it can, where, it, where we can. Other optimization, it's constant folding. So this example is a bit uh, contrived, but when you have a constant, you call a function with a constant, we can do a lot of pre-compute at compile time. And this code will turn out to be a pure static value at, in the end. We don't generate any code at runtime that will ex be executed at runtime. For that, we get directly the, the value. So it happens a lot of time when you have a constant, global constant, and you have some helper function to com combine those constants into a result that you want. It's usually not that costly, but when it is in a loop or at the end of a call graph, it will save you function call. It will save you, uh, if it's one, even if it's cheap, if it's one million times or one billion times an operation, well, it's still a few percent uh, speed up that you can get. OK, so finally, after all this optimization, we try to do a little bit better. And for that, nowadays, you know it. You don't get any more free lunch. Processor doesn't offer you any more frequency increased like it was 10 years ago. Uh, we are stuck at uh, less than 3 giga gigahertz for most of us. But we have many cores. So we need to parallelize. And we have many cores. And each of these cores have vector units. So if you are able to use vector units and parallelization, you can get a lot of speed up. So OpenMP is a standard which is well known for many years. Um, it's widely used. And we support OpenMP in, in Python. So you can just add a command in front of a loop here, OMP parallel 4. And it tells the compiler that the loop nest will be executed in parallel. And it will use multiple thread. So Python is able to detect which variables are private and which are shared, so you don't have to declare it uh, yourself. It saves you a bit of typing, and well, that's convenient. And you can see the results with this loop. I have a um, uh, four times speed up on my machine, which, uh, which has uh, four cores. So that's pretty good. So without, the, without OpenMP, we have a 14 times speed up, and with OpenMP, uh, 57, which is quite good. And this is the only thing. We, we don't change anything in the function except from adding uh, this OMP parallel 4 and, of course, the typing uh, information for, for the interface. <coughs> so um, library level optimization. So in scientific computing, NumPy is key. Um, you do high level array manipulation. Many common functions are implemented this way. So all of this smells like Fortran. And for compi compiler guys like us, Fortran means performance. Um, Fortran means easy vectorization, parallelization. And this is why we are named Python. <coughs> Excuse me. So Cyton is known to be as fast as C. So the only way we could be faster would be to be as fast as Fortran. So in the same way that NumEx tried to save uh, temporary allocation and fusing loops in NumPy expression, we do it in C++ using expression templates. It's a well-known C++ 
metaprogramming techniques, um, which works, well, you build some expression. They are only evaluated when you need the results. So there is no, no loops. It's kind of a loop fusion in C++. It's very elegant. We have uh, some vectorization using Boost SIMD and NT2. So all our operations are written in a way that the C++ compiler and this, this library will be instantiated with the most efficient instruction for your CPU using AVX or SSE or depend, whatever, depending on, you, on your current machine. So right now, we're just uh, in the process of reorganizing the backend. So we disabled uh, this vectorization, but we hope to get it back soon. And uh, the OpenMP support is, is there. We also dropped the automatic OpenMP, which means that we don't, uh, when we do uh, copy or some sum, we used to automatically use OpenMP. And also because we are re rewriting the backend, we also remove this for, for now. But it will be back soon. So some benchmark now. First, um, a Cyton example that we took from the SIP, last IP uh, Cyton tutorial. It computes the Julia set. And uh, you can see that uh, Python is uh, a little bit faster than Cyton, which is expected because it's Fortran, right? And if we had OpenMP, we can even be a lot faster, almost three times faster than Cyton. So yeah, that's an example. On, we didn't write it for Python. It's not, I took it from Cyton, so it should be what Cyton knows to do. The same way, um, I want it to be as fair as possible. So I took an example from Numba, from a Numba tutorial. So it should perfectly suit Numba. And uh, it computes Mandel Mandelbrot. I'm sure you all know about Mandelbrot. This is why I didn't put a picture of this nice fractal. OK, I was lazy. This is why I didn't do it. But <laughs> anyway, um, well, you see the results. Numba provides an awesome um, 145 speed up. And we managed to do a little bit faster. I had to use a GCC minus O fast to get it, because Numba was a little bit faster than us without that. And yeah, the fast option helps here. I did it at 5 o'clock this morning, so yeah. Um, and Queens, uh, this solved this famous problem where you have a chessboard and you need to position the Queens so that no one can attack each one. Uh, yeah, well, that's a chess problem. Anyway, uh, we just have this example because we wanted to show some cool Python stuff. Um, not as cool as C++, of course. So we have a generator. You can see that we, just for fun, we have rewritten the permutation, the ITER tools permutation, purely in Python. It's on the left. You don't, don't use it. It's just here to show that we can do it. And they are yelled inside. Uh, there are list comprehension. On the right part, there is the body of nQueen solver. There is set initialized with list comprehension. So it's really Pythonic, I guess. It's not like you have to modify your code so that we can really handle it. And we directly compile this with uh, Python. And I also used PyPy. And you can see uh, that we are not as fast as PyPy on this example, but that's not, yeah. We are not also not far away from it. So it's quite interesting to see that we have a good language support for, for Python and that the subset that we support is, I think, quite wide. Some benchmark. So those are NumPy benchmark. Um, we didn't write it. Usually we took them from many sources and we combined them in a Git repository where I just have to run make and it will go through all compilers using time it and produce uh, some results. And yeah, because I really enjoyed the day here yesterday, uh, I thought that last night I have to produce a graph with matplotlib. So that's the first time I use matplotlib. I hope you enjoy uh, the results. Uh, maybe next time I will try also to put some colors. I heard that there is a support for that. Um, so take care that the scale is logged, starting at 20. Yeah, there are some cool options in. Uh, in Matplotlib, you can have a log scale at a certain point. So what you can see here is that, um, so the first column, I should present the data. The first column, the 
most dark one is Numba, the second one is Python, and the third one is Parakeet. And what you can see is that Python never slow downs your program. And none of these cases will provide a slowdown. So a slowdown is when the curve goes down. So the horizontal kind of line is one. Everything is normalized with respect to C Python. And we never, oh yeah, we slow down once on the first example, arc, di arc distance. Yeah, I had to have one where we fail. Um, but still, we, Numba has some slowdown, Parakeet has some slowdown, and we don't. We are not always the fastest. Uh, Numba is the fastest on two examples. Parakeet also is the fastest on three examples, I think. But uh, you have the geometric uh, mean at the end, the last column. Uh, where you can see that uh, we, we still have uh, a better results than uh, what, I, what, what we were able to get with those two other compilers. Nimba has uh, something like five times speed up overall, and we are close, closer to, to um, 50 or 40, I don't know. Uh, yeah, the loss scale doesn't help to read, and I didn't find with Matplotlib how to put the numbers on top of the column, but. That will be for next time. Um, yesterday, I attended a very nice talk about crushing the head of the snake. It was in the other room. I hope you had the chance to see it. If you didn't, then just check out the video. I hope we will get it soon. So I would have titled it What Every Pythonista Should Know About Python, by the way, uh, because I think you should, everyone should know that before writing code. So I went through the example. Last, uh, yesterday evening, I uh, yeah, just to see what Python can do on that. So this is the example at the starting point where you can see that the programmers didn't know that you can do a sum in Python. So on the top left, he wrote a total function doing its own sum, which is completely, obviously, slow. And well, there are a lot of things that you can do on this, and I invite you to have a look at this talk. And the first uh, modification is, is a very small one where you just remove um, loop invariants. So if I can show you the first statement of the loop on the right part, that can be, can be uh, moved out of the loop. And the same in the, in, on the loop on the left, uh, the bottom part, the mean equal total array divided by length of array can be moved out of the loop. And those two simple modifications is the only difference between the first column and the second column. And you can see that uh, we go from uh, a very long time, more than two minutes, to a few milliseconds. So that's really small modifications with a huge impact. And what I took from that is, and you should take from that, is that you sh before using a tool to optimize your code, you should just write good code in the first place. Because Python won't do magic. It will give you a nice speed up, like 100 times on your code. You may be happy, but if you just move two lines, you will be even faster than Python. Python. And yeah, OK, next week will be as fast as, as, as the second version, because uh, this transformation could be easily done by Python, by the way, this uh, moving the constant computation out of the loop. So that was a good idea that I had during this talk yesterday. We will improve Python to handle this case. And we should be able to do four milliseconds, because just doing this transformation in Python means we will get four milliseconds. And then with other transformation um, that was applied to the code, the code was getting faster in Python. Uh, Python didn't really care. We get almost the same time, as you can see. Almost no change. Um, and finally, when we get to NumPy array instead of list, uh, this is where also we have another speed up. So yeah, really, you can see that even if Python gives you in the end eight times speed up, writing good codes give you, I don't know, a thousand times speed up, something like that. So yeah, the tool has to be in, at the end, not in the first place. So I'm almost at the end. Some engineering stuff. We use GitHub. It's an open source project since the beginning. We are open to pull requests. Um, but take care. I'm very picky with the code review. We have a Debian repository. We are very active on IRC. Uh, there is someone almost around the clock, especially because we are a French project, but I live here, so we have my 
colleague in France. I'm here with the time, different time frame. We are around the clock on IRC. Uh, we also have a mailing list that we use mostly for announcements. There is not much discussion there. Everything is going on on IRC. Um, it's available on PyPy. It's very easy to install using easy install. You, uh, it's written in Python 2. We only use, support Python 2, by the way. We don't support Python 3 yet. We have more than 2,000 uh, test cases in our regression suite. It's run automatically every time a pull request is issued. Uh, all the code is PEP8, and uh, we support Clang, GCC as a backend. It's validated on Linux and OS X. So yeah, it's very easy to, it should be quite easy to use. So time for conclusion. Compiling Python means more than typing and translating. There are a lot of optimization that we can do in Python. What next for Python? Um, release the PyData version. And for that, maybe we are a bit late. It was scheduled for last week. But I didn't specify which year. So we are still up for next year, and I will be glad to come back. Uh, we want to support module imports, user module. Right now, when you write code in Python, you write this, your Python module that you will compile. It cannot import code from other of your module. I already have a pull request open for that, so it should be there soon. You will be able to import just functions that are everywhere in your program and get them into, used into a single module. Um, sometimes when we modify code, we care about performance, but we don't always run all the performance regression suits. So we had a lot of regressions. That's really painful. So we have an ongoing work with uh, CodeSpeed, which is used by uh, PyPy, I think, to track uh, performance. We have to re-enable vectorization because that provides a huge boost, usually. And yeah, we need to be ahead, ahead of uh, Numba and the other. So we really need it. We need more NumPy support. I think we have a very good support, but probably will disagree with me because I'm sure the first example you will try, you will use the NumPy, not all the NumPy function that we don't support. And we also have to start looking into SciPy that we don't support at all right now. And because uh, that was a kind of, uh, I worked with this during my PhD, which was about compiling, automatically compiling code for GPU. Um, we want to incorporate some polyhedral transformation in Python, that would be really fun. But while well, we are working uh, on this project on our free time, so probably it's going to be for another life. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. And uh, I'm waiting for your questions. So uh, <clears throat> earlier on, you showed that you can take arbitrary iterators and do optimizations for like maps on them. Uh, what are the restrictions on types of generators or iterators you can uh, actually use? Because I imagine you can't just run arbitrary Python generators. Uh, what do you mean by arbitrary Python, <laughs> Python generators? Um, so earlier you did stuff with mapping over ranges or zipping over ranges. Um, are there other types of generators that you can automatically uh, optimize? Um, well, I'm not sure I got the question. What we do is, uh, I'm, did you talk about these slides or? Uh, no, it was a lot earlier one? on. The map, like paralyzing a map automatically? Yeah. Um, well, we support any operator as long as we, as we can prove that, that they are um, pure and that the map, the result of the map, it depends on the result of the map. So it was this slide, I think. Yeah. Right, maybe. So, so transforming this map into IMAP. Also, it's not, OK, I see what you mean. The, what do we support? We support a filter, map. Uh, I don't have the full list in my head. Okay, so, uh, but here uh, you basically can only operate on lists or things that can create lists like range. So you can't, can you pass in an X range here? Yeah, you can. By, by the way, we are turning range into X range when we can. Okay. Yeah, this is a, yeah, well, I didn't mention it, but obviously we don't create temporaries. We, we are crazy about performance, and to get performance, we have to save memory because this is what is low on your computer, it's always the memory bandwidth. 
most of the time. Uh, especially if you use uh, Python, then you have a lot of temporary arrays. And we try to save as much temporary allocation as we can. OK. Oh, also something we try to do, because I'm talking about memory, is not to leak. Because many tools around here are not playing well with the Python uh, garbage collector. And we try, and we are, I think, almost there. We have a branch where we don't leak. Uh, we shouldn't leak. We are still testing it. but. Yeah, the, the plan is that you can, in, you can run it into a software out of just running a benchmark with time it in command line. You can keep it in, uh, in your process and it won't leak memory. Um, two questions. Uh, it's about things you support and don't support because one of the slides you said we don't support this and the last slide you said we don't support import. So, um, in the past, there was an issue with globals. Did you take care of it? Uh, yeah, we have a pull request for that. It's not merged there uh, yet. Uh, yeah, it's not yet merged. But uh, uh, right now, you cannot have global variables into in the Python module. Okay. And soon, you will be able to have it. Yeah. Okay, so soon it will. Pro and what about the import statements? Uh, is there, if there's a Python program with an import of several libraries at the beginning, do you ignore them? Do you just no. uncompile? What yeah, happens? yeah. We, we, this is also something with, uh, with um, static compilation, is that you can fail at compile time, provide an error message saying, we don't support this import statement. So we support uh, import for many modules, built-in modules. Uh, many NumPy modules. You can import NumPy, of course, in Python code. You can import math. You can import those kind of modules. But what we don't support is user module. You write your own module, Python code, and so you have two files, and you want to import function from one file on the other, and compile one of these two files with Python. So again, this is a matter of week, because the pull request is open, so just have a lot of things to do. Hi, right, great talk. Uh, What's the user experience like? In particular, how dumb can I be and still use Python, uh, both, both in the use of it and in the setup of it? Uh, well, um, first you have to be not too dumb, because you will be in this situation. OK, so at least you have to, to know, uh, to know uh, Python. And then uh, I think I showed uh, this IPython session, so to start with. To start with, the only thing you you have to do is add this uh, type information. And the only, so Python doesn't directly use this type information. It will generate a C++ code. But to be able to compile the C++ code, G++ need to instantiate the template. This is where we use this for the interface between Python and the code generated by Python. So you need to add one or multiple uh, of these statements, the green statement that you have on the screen. Um, so here it's a declaration that, uh, the Rosen function will be exported, and I, you will be able to use it with an array of floats. Um, and this is the only change I, I made to the code. You know, I load the Python magic, I exported the function, and that, that's it. What about installation? Is it pip installable? Can I type in pip install Python? Will that work? Y yeah, yeah, it's on. Uh, uh, usually, I use easy install. Uh, it's on PyPy. PyP. PyP. PyPy Py Py or PyP? I don't even know. What do you say? Who cares? Any other question? Yes. No, wait, just for the, the mic. What are we calling? OK, thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Um, so I assume the code is compared to C first, right? Yes. And they use um, C compiler to compile your code. So I assume that the compiler will differ as well. Like if you're using G++ versus C++, claim, claim yeah. plus plus, claim, yeah. what do you generally suggest for for Python program if, if we just uh, but Both of them are working fine. You just yeah. need a recent version, which means GCC uh, starting at uh, version 4.8. And it's almost two years old, I think. So it's not that recent, but some Linux distribution. If you have a Red Hat, for instance, you will be stuck like five years five years uh, in the past. So you need a modern C++ compiler. 
but both Clang and G++ are used, and we run the regression suite on every pull request uh, on both of the compiler. So it, both of them are well supported. Some code, uh, I have uh, faster results with uh, Clang. It's obviously faster to compile the code, Clang. It gives you nice, uh, nicer warning. I really prefer Clang, and I use it as much as possible. But uh, sometimes G++ is uh, faster, you know? So it depends. Um, C++ compilation, and compilation in general is a, is a bit of dark magic. I showed you this example where just changing uh, the minus O fast for G++ gave me better results. And it was like 20% faster with this minus O fast than minus O2 that I use uh, usually. So, well, you, you have to try. We have a, Python comes with a configuration file, and in your home directory, you can just uh, have a, a configuration file where you, uh, you change the compiler, and you change the flag that you want to pass to a compiler. Uh, I can show you maybe what it looks like. So, let me see if I can zoom. That's a nice Mac feature. Yeah, so that's my uh, Python RC, and, um, yeah, I just have some specific paths because I use a Mac and I didn't install Boost in the standard pass. I, use, I install Boost with a port and then some flag and you can see that I have my alternative configuration with GCC and right now I'm using uh, mostly Clang. So yeah, I just changed the flag here, test it. The, by default, you don't have to create this file. Python has a default configuration that should work fine on most con configuration, just if you want to tune it. Um, yeah. So we are out of time. So if you want to ask question, uh, I'm still open uh, and I'm there. I will be there for lunch and so on. So thank you for attending. <laughs>